Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Family Research Council. I am Pat Fagan, uh, Director of the Marriage and Religion Research Institute here at FRC. And it's our pleasure and our honor to welcome the Howard Center, who are presenting on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's time to liven up Family Research Council here. But it's the legacy of the 60s in family. Um, the Howard Center is, in my mind, uh, the grandfather of the thinking family movement in the United States. Uh, it was founded in 1998 um, by Dr. Alan Carlson, who is one of the premier, if not the premier, scholar on marriage and family uh, since back before that even. Um, and they are the publishers of The Family in America, which is the occasion, uh, the special issue of The Family in America is devoted to the topic of the day. And uh, The Family in America started in 1987 and was a monthly and then switched to a quarterly in 2009. And within The Family in America is one of my favorite sections of all journals. They have, they conduct their essays, great essays, and written in there, much as we will see today. But they have a, an ongoing section at the back on social science research finding with essays that draw out, small essays, keying right in on key articles and key pieces of research and l loads of different facets of marriage and family life. And I'm um, looking forward to the day when it's all easily searchable on the web because it is one of the treasures of the family movement. And now I am going to hand it over to Nicole King, who's going to MC this, but we welcome you, Nicole, mm -hmm. and all of your presenters. It's our pleasure. The podium is yours. Good morning. My name is Nicole King. I'm the managing editor of The Family in America. Thank you for being here today. Um, so we are um, Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, the family policy legacy of the 60s. Um, the years 1964 through 1965 witnessed, as you know, the onset of a moral revolution. In quick and stunning sequence, the family in America came under assault from a number of new foes. The new feminists, the advocates of population control, sexual radicals, the counterculture, the new left, and with far too few exceptions, those responsible for protecting ordered liberty and morality, clerics, judges, colleges, administrators, publishers, were either absent without leave or joined in the process. Before the decade was over, America had seen a total moral and legal overhaul, the consequences of which we are still reaping today. But exactly how did the social and moral revolutions of that decade reshape law and public policy? To what degree are contemporary American family pathologies, the decay of marriage, tumbling fertility, fatherless children, the hookup culture, easy divorce, the consequences of the 60s? What lessons from the past might help us in the task of family reconstruction which lies ahead? Here to discuss those questions today are our panelists. William Duncan, Ryan McPherson, and Anne Robeck Morse. Uh, William Duncan is the director of the Marriage Law Foundation, established in 2004 with the mission of reaffirming the legal definition of marriage as the union of husband and wife. Prior to arriving at the foundation, Mr. Duncan served as the acting director of the Marriage Law Project at the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law and is executive director of the Marriage and Family Law Research Grant at J. Reuben Clark Law School at Brigham Young. His writing has appeared in Rutgers University Law Review, Stanford Review of Law and Politics, Ave Maria Law Review, and others. Ryan McPherson is Associate Professor of History and Chair of the History Department at Bethany Lutheran College in Mankato, Minnesota. He's the author of Rediscovering the American Republic and the Culture of Life, Ten Essential Principles for Christian Bioethics, as well as numerous articles and essays. Dr. McPherson was the principal author of A Friend of the Court Brief for Perry v. Schwarzenegger, renamed Perry v. Brown, in support of the Prop 8 California Marriage Amendment, and also serves on the Circle of Experts for the Ruth Institute. 
He is the founding president of the House Voter Project and senior editor of The Family in America. And Anne Robeck Morse is the media and research coordinator for the Population Research Institute. She's a recent grad from the University of California, Berkeley, where she majored in political economy with a concentration in economics of human rights. Uh, Ms. Morse took a particular interest in demography while at UC Berkeley. She served on the executive board of Berkeley's pro-life group for all four years and also interned for nonprofits, political action committees, political campaigns, and on Capitol Hill. She has authored many reports on demographic trends in her post at PRI, and she'll commence a PhD program at Penn State in population in the fall. So um, just so you know, the order will be these three will present. Each will have about 12 to 15 minutes. And then if you could hold any questions, uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end. So please welcome our speakers. Well, good morning. It's uh, an honor to be here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, and grateful for the help that I'll get with the slides today. Um, I want to talk about uh, the marriage drama by referring first to Act One. And so on our first, uh, first slide you'll see, uh, the, the next slide, uh, gives, a, gives an example of some language from a California Supreme Court decision in 1952. So this is Act One of the drama. Here's the language. Uh, I've, I've uh, summarized it a little bit here. Marriage is a great deal more than a contract. The family is the basic unit of our society, the center of the personal affections that ennoble and enrich human life. It channels biological drives that might otherwise become socially destructive and ensures the care and education of children in a stable environment. It establishes continuity from one generation to another. It nurtures and develops the individual initiative that distinguishes a free people. Since family is the core of our society, the law seeks to foster and preserve marriage. It's a powerful statement. It reflects in many ways an understanding, as you'll see in the next slide, of marriage and family and, and of uh, sexuality more generally that was consistent with, uh, consistently endorsed by the U.S. Supreme Court over its history previous to this time period. Okay, so 1952, that gives us a good sense of what's going on in Act One. And I'm going to say that Act Two begins in, in the 1970s, as I'll talk about. Something dramatic happens, though, in that time period in between, the intermission of the 1960s. What happens during that time period that language like uh, you saw from the California court essentially disappears, certainly from the U.S. Supreme Court's account of marriage. What happens? And this, the, the, what, what I argue, many things happen, as you'll hear today, but in the Supreme Court, the key change is a decision by uh, the court in 1965 striking down Connecticut's uh, law prohibiting the use of contraceptives. In that case, the court uh, focuses on the idea of a right to privacy and specifically says a right of marital privacy, which is, is somewhat less uh, controversial than, than, uh, uh, than some of its later decisions would be. But what I think is kind of interesting, there's a, a part right at the end of the court's opinion where they describe what marriage means, what they believe marriage means, that gives us a clue to a very dramatic shift that has occurred in the thinking of the justices from these, uh, these opinions we've seen here to what we're going to see happen uh, from here out. And so on the next slide, you'll see this. This step is, uh, the case is called Griswold versus Connecticut. And here's the definition of marriage that the court uh, uses. Actually, one slide back, pardon me. Uh, marriage is coming together for better or for worse, hopefully enduring and intimate to the degree of being sacred. It's an association that promotes a way of life, not causes, a harmony in living, not political faiths, a bilateral loyalty, not commercial or social projects. Yet, it's an association for as noble a purpose as any involved in our prior decisions. Okay, here's the, here's the key shift. This is a tentative move away from the past. Uh, we do see the seeds for the complete hollowing out of marriage and family beginning in this decision. Note the word hopefully. We hope it endures. We can't guarantee that it will, and we certainly won't do anything to make sure that it will, I think the court is saying, but we hope it does. Also, the use of the word association. In previous court cases, the, the terms would have been something like union or institution. Some suggestion that marriage actually joins two people together. Here are two individuals who sort of 
they're obviously in, in league with one another in some way, but what the, the nature of that league is somewhat unclear. Now, most important to me, uh, as, as we look at the change in the law, it actually occurs in the next important case from the Supreme Court, uh, Eisenstadt versus Baird, in the next slide. And uh, here the court makes a very interesting logical step, but really codifies this new understanding of marriage. So the court here is striking down a, uh, a law that uh, prohibited the use of contraceptives by unmarried people. And uh, you'll, you'll probably smile at this first sentence. If under Griswold, the distribution of contraceptives to married persons cannot be prohibited, a ban on distribution to unmarried persons would be equally impermissible. Is, I'm not sure what the logic there is. If it's, if, it's, uh, if it's marital privacy, why would it apply to unmarried people? But that's an important point. Uh, the court says it's true that the Griswold's connected to marriage, but we don't necessarily going to uh, uh, limit it here. Here's what they say about marriage. The married couple is not an independent entity with a mind and heart of its own. It's an association of two individuals, each with a separate intellectual and emotional makeup. So for the court, if the right to privacy means anything, it is the right of the individual, married or single, to be free from unwarranted governmental intrusions in a matter so fundamentally affecting a person as the decision whether to bear or beget a child. And this is important language that we see turn up again. The key issue here is that the court is saying that there really is no distinction between marriage and non-marriage. And so marriage is reduced in that, and, and, and to some extension, family itself is reduced to a mere lifestyle choice. It's an individual right, not a right of an entity of two people who've joined together in a binding union. So the logic then relentlessly follows from this opinion. Uh, in the next slide, and, and we'll next, the next couple of slides, we'll just uh, quickly note some of the cases. So just a year later, the Supreme Court says in uh, Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton, this, the abortion case, that there's a right to abortion on demand. The same year, Congress uh, uh, had passed a law distinguishing between households of related and unrelated people and the distribution of food stamps and eligibility for food stamps. And the court says, no, 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 uh, that's not an acceptable distinction here. Uh, the court is, uh, says the Congress is trying to strike out uh, against uh, the poor hippie communes who want to live together and get food stamps, and that's not allowed. Unrelated, related people, there shouldn't be a distinction made in the law. And then, even more uh, important in some ways, in 1976, the court says that a spousal consent requirement to abortion, so that, it, so that uh, if, if one of the parents wants to abort the child and the other uh, does not, and they're married to one another, uh, that, that law is unconstitutional. And uh, uh, Professor William Van Alstyne's made an interesting comment about this, that, that because of this decision, uh, one who's con conceived a child in marriage uh, with his wife has no more standing to claim an interest in the well-being of the child thus conceived than the most casual male acquaintance with whom she may have had an equally casual one-night affair. In other words, n none at all. That's, that's the, the upshot of the court's decision. And then in the next slide, we, we, we see a, a, another set of cases. In 1977, the court strikes down a requirement that contraceptives be, be distributed only by physicians, saying the government has to ensure that nothing limits access to the means of effectuating the decision to use contraceptives. There's an interesting shift there from the negative right recognized in the previous cases that the, the government can't prohibit people from accessing contraceptives. Now the court is saying the, gov the government needs to make an actual uh, uh, affirmative effort to ensure that a access is available to everybody without their having to go through a doctor. And you see, of course, echoes of this in the current policies related to contraceptives in the United States. The next major marriage case the court dealt with is in 1970. Uh, eight in Wisconsin, when the court struck down a law saying that uh, if a couple is, or if a, a pardon me, a person is seeking a marriage license but is behind on it, uh, his child support payments, that the court has to approve the license to marry to ensure that that that, uh, that he uh, first uh, become a current on his on his obligations, and the court strikes that law down and says there's really no per se significance to marriage, um, only as it relates to the individual choice. Uh, that's, that's all that's worth constitutionally protecting. 
and uh, and we see the next important uh, case that has to do with marriage following that is a case that involves prisoners where the court says uh, what are the attributes of marriage well they're expressions of emotional support public commitment it's a way of accessing government benefits you see marriage looks very very different in that account uh, we'll continue on our slides and uh, talk about a, a somewhat infamous case where the U.S. Supreme Court revisits the question of, of abortion, but interestingly does so in a way that implicates marriage. Because the, the law challenged in Planned Parenthood versus Casey uh, included a spousal notification requirement, not, not, not consent, but the notification that if a person uh, is uh, considering an abortion and she's married, she has to at least tell the husband that she's considering this. And the court has this famous uh, statement about uh, uh, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's uh, own meaning of existence and uh, uh, the, the meaning of human life and, and all of these kinds of things, a flowery statement. Uh, but it's interesting that that statement is offered in the specific context to notify her husband of her contemplation of abortion is quote, repugnant to our present understanding of marriage, unquote. And what's the understanding of marriage? Well, the court quotes Eisenstadt versus Baird, the previous decision about contraceptives. And you'll see in this next slide just some of the other uh, cases that follow from this. Um, the key thing here is that marriage is now fully accepted. This understanding of marriage that the Supreme Court has adopted is now fully accepted. And not only as one possibility, but the only licit possibility for understanding marriage. It's an association of two people loosely associated with one another. Uh, maybe we'd say a loose association of autonomous rights bearers. Each one has their rights and they can use them against one another if they'd like. You see these principles continue in a, in a trio of cases from the U.S. Supreme Court, all written by Justice Anthony Kennedy. The one noted here is Romer versus Evans. In the next slide, the, you'll see the citations to Lawrence versus Texas and United States versus Windsor, which is the 2013 decision where the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Last week, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, last week, uh, the Solicitor General of the United States made an argument before the U.S. Supreme Court in the current same-sex marriage cases, and his language was uh, uh, struck immediately that uh, court of the 60s, because he's paraphrasing in this decision the language of Griswold versus Connecticut about the meaning of marriage. Note that he even uses the word uh, hopefully. Hope marriage is hopefully enduring. So he, its language comes right out of that decision, and so it's very much with us now. In these decisions, marriage is now, uh, I think we'd say, a choice of two autonomous individuals to associate on a par with other relationship choices and with the purpose of allowing individuals to engage in two perhaps parallel projects of self-expression and self-creation. And we'll see, uh, maybe I've, I've summarized this in the next slide. In the inherited wisdom that the court rejects in these decisions, sexual expression was a moral act with significant consequences. Marriage was the only licit setting for sexual relationships to occur because it united two very different individuals, two different types of people. One is called a man and one is called a woman. And their union was not merely a, 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 a kind of a loose association, but an actual binding joining of two people. It's not momentary desire or calculated uh, a, a, a contract to try and get a certain result, but an actual joining, an actual union. And it created reciprocal obligations towards one another, but beyond that, and perhaps more importantly, to the children that their union alone could create. Though the act of marriage was freely chosen, consented to, as, as we're, and we're all grateful for that, um, the consequences of a marriage could not really be chosen. Would children come? Would they not? What would the children be like? Uh, how would they act? How would they treat their parents? We don't know. Children born to married couples then then had a, a particular blessing. They had a ble the blessing of belonging and the setting in a setting of stability, complementarity, they have access to both types of humanity and usually they would have biological connectedness to their parents. Um, in contrast, as, uh, as I think uh, we see here, the ideology of a sexual revolution imagines there's no significant difference between men and women. Sexual expression is just a means of obtaining pleasure at, at the least, though it might rise, the court says, to 
an act of self-creation, of kind of expressing oneself, like a tattoo but easier to remove. Since it's the most potent toolkit in the, uh, in, in the uh, box of tools of expressive individualism. By rights, for the court, it ought to have no real consequences unless those consequences are each freely chosen by the individual. What does that mean in practice? Well, each person has a right to be shielded, and indeed the state has a duty to shield individuals from the consequences of their actions relating to sexuality and family by increasing access to contraceptives, by streamlining the divorce process. If there's consequences that come as a result of these actions, like pregnancy or unhappiness, uh, the state has to provide some escape route, as we've described. Now, no freely chosen sexual coupling to the court is illicit now, and none should be privileged above others. Civil marriage is a manifestation of individual will. It's valuable only because it allows the state to bestow dignity upon the choices of individuals. If the parties desire marriage could, bestow, uh, could be useful to the purpose of defining yourself, defining your meaning of the universe, uh, if it's not, that's fine too. Secondarily, of course, marriage can be uh, accessorized by children. If the couple would like to have children to sort of add to their relationship, that's, that's allowed. Um, they're, cons they're presumably going to have some benefit from that choice of the parents because they'll have access to two adults of whatever kind and to government benefits uh, that are provided to married couples, again, as a way of valorizing the adult choice. So in our revolution here, we have a, a strong ideology, and like all, all modern revolutions, and the court becomes essentially the vanguard of the revolution because of its supreme role in constitutional interpretation. It allows the court to become the ultimate arbiter. They, they're securing for themselves the ability to become the ultimate arbiter of what marriage and family means and about what policies the states are allowed to pursue, and, and the federal government as well. Mm -hmm. So one particularly interesting note about all of this, as you watch these cases develop, with some consistency, they all seem to follow a similar logic in terms of their results over, over a, a multi-decade period. But what's interesting about it is that um, this has happened despite the fact that the, the legal principles the court has relied on in previous cases have been abandoned in other cases. So the, the principle, for instance, uh, in uh, Griswold has been abandoned basically by the court in every other setting, but it still lives in the marriage and family setting. I think this is the principle that Lenin, and I guess since we're talking about the 60s, I should say Vladimir, not John, uh, he relished this principle. The success of the revolution is the supreme law. And we see that happening here where uh, binding uh, uh, principles that, that bind the court in other settings are abandoned in order to get to these results. Now, later this year, as we know, the, U the U.S. Supreme Court is going to revisit the issue of same-sex marriage, specifically giving it an opportunity to either step away from the revolutionary project of reframing norms of morality and redefining marriage and give it, at the same time, an opportunity to decentralize decision-making power away from the court itself. It's another, another element of a revolutionary decision is that it's going to, it's going to, to uh, uh, centralize decision-making power in one body. Whatever the court does, the current, current vermin over marriage provides a really important opportunity for others, like churches. It allows them to champion an alternative mod, a model of marriage that will stand out like a, as you use a, a black background to, to show off the pearl or the diamond. Uh, that uh, court's decisions may provide an important background for non-government institutions like churches to champion this alternative model of marriage that's rooted in experience and in inherited wisdom that we saw the court abandon from Act I. I think the b best statement of this, uh, of this understanding is the one that Dietrich Bonhoeffer expressed when he wrote to his niece. Uh, in your love, you see only the heaven of your own happiness. But in marriage, you're placed at a post of responsibility towards the world and mankind. Your love is your own private possession, but marriage is more than something personal. It is a status, an office. Just as it is the crown and not mere, merely the will to rule that makes the king, so it is marriage and not merely your love for each other that joins you together in the sight of God and man. That's the alternative that we're offering, uh, 
alternative understanding of marriage that we're offering against the, what the court has done. And perhaps the court decisions, as negative as, as they've been uh, for family policy, will allow that understanding some contrast that will help it to be more broadly accepted uh, by our fellow citizens. And that that may be so is my uh, fervent hope. Good morning, everyone, and thank you again to the Family Research Council for hosting us here today. The title of my presentation is Whose Fault Was No Fault Divorce? The Story Behind America's Most Enduring Oxymoron. An oxymoron is a phrase that contains two words with opposite and conflicting meanings. When the language aficionado Bo Mitchell judged 461 entries for the 1983 Great Oxymoron Contest, he ranked wedded bliss as third, and as number 13, no-fault divorce. Even if some wedded people no longer expected to experience bliss a generation ago, it still was somewhat revolutionary to speak of divorce without having anyone to blame. Prior to the California Family Law Act of 1969, divorce across the 50 states required an adversarial procedure. A plaintiff filed for divorce, alleging specific faults by the other spouse who was named as the defendant. The clerk called the case uh, Doe v. Doe, indicating one spouse versus the other, only upon evidence of statutory grounds for fault, adultery, desertion, cruelty, did the court decide in favor of the plaintiff and grant a decree of divorce. As other states followed California's lead through the 1970s, fault vanished from the proceedings and so did other contextual clues as to the real meaning of divorce. The plaintiff became a petitioner, the defendant a respondent. The case was renamed In Re Doe. The venue shifted to the newly established and purportedly user-friendly family court and no one alleged that anyone had done anything wrong. In fact, even that old-fashioned pejorative term divorce yielded to a matter-of-fact neologism, disillusion of marriage, devoid of any moral significance. This disillusion revolution never quite finished its course, however, and instead the term no-fault divorce acquired colloquial acceptance. So how do we come to this point? Who is responsible for this no-fault revolution? I'll highlight three groups. First, liberal theologians, supposing that a less adversarial encounter would allow love to shape the result. They urged for no-fault reform within both church and state, even before state legislatures had changed their marriage laws. Second, progressive lawyers and legislatures sponsored no-fault reform to eliminate fraudulent claims of fault and to streamline judicial proceedings. This was reinforced then by feminists who sought to tilt the reforms further in the direction of gender equity. And finally, the third group I'll look at would be social and moral conservatives, people who otherwise may have opposed no-fault divorce, but they chose to remain silent about the topic as they cautiously built a constituency to wage a culture war that was centered on other vices. Thus, here we are in the land of the free and the home of the oxymoron, no-fault divorce. Let's look then at the first group, liberal theologians who were moving ahead of both the legal and the theological curve. And I'm going to discuss this point with a case study drawn from the history of American Lutheranism, although I think the results would come out with about the same pattern for any major Protestant denomination. The United Lutheran Church of America, ULCA, which was on the liberal end of the spectrum at the early part of the century, nevertheless initially had a conservative uh, stance on marriage, declaring in 1930, in general, therefore, all divorce is sin, quote, unless he, the pastor, is convinced that the individual is the innocent party. By 1956, however, the liberal tendencies within that church body had begun to show themselves regarding the question of marriage and divorce. The National Convention now agreed that, quote, Christian love and concern for the welfare of all involved might at times make reconciliation inadvisable. Remarriage, rather than being permitted only to the innocent party, now could proceed for either party. The 1956 position statement even called for uniform and constructive marriage and divorce laws that would avoid adversary litigation and permit a smoother adjustment once a civil dissolution of marriage seems inevitable. 
1962, the United Lutheran Church of America merged with several other Lutheran bodies to form the Lutheran Church of America, LCA. Two years later, this new body adopted language identical to that 1956 statement that I just quoted, calling for a less adversarial approach to civil disillusions of marriage. By 1970, the LCA was ready to take official action. The convention adopted the position that divorce was not intrinsically sinful and at times may even be morally superior to the preservation of a marriage. The LCA had completely reversed the statements of its predecessor body, the ULCA, from the 1930s. In certain circumstances, divorce would not only be tolerated, but actually preferred, and these circumstances need not involve the assignment of moral fault. In 1987, the LCA joined with two other associations of Lutheran congregations to form the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. In 2009, that body adopted a social statement concerning human sexuality. Although expressing an aspiration for marriage to be lifelong and monogamous, the resolution avoided any negative judgment concerning adultery or desertion and extended to all persons the freedom to marry someone new. In the drafting of this document, a proposed amendment to define marriage as a lifelong normative covenant received significant support, but fell short of the required majority. By that time, of course, many parishioners had already inherited a legacy of legal reforms that had excised fault from the statutory definitions of divorce. And so let's go to part two, where we look at progressive lawyers who were charting efficient paths to what they called individual liberty. Proponents of divorce reform in California ostensibly hoped to accomplish four things. First, to slow the rising divorce rate. Second, to eliminate hypocrisy in charges of fault. Third, to render court proceedings less confrontational. And fourth, foster more equitable outcomes for spouses. Following legislative hearings in 1964, Governor Brown assembled a commission on the family in 1966 to suggest revisions to marriage laws and to explore the establishment of family courts for handling divorce cases. By 1969, the State Assembly had settled upon a new Family Law Act that sanitized the language of divorce, which now became dissolution of marriage, and established fairness rather than fault as the standard for determining support, what previously was called alimony. Because the legislature emphasized its desire to reduce adversity and foster amicable negotiations in these new family courts, likely opponents to no-fault divorce, such as Roman Catholics, became supporters of what they misperceived to be a mild reform rather than what it was, a fundamental revolution. California's no-fault law had both an ideological and a personal connection to the 1974 Uniform Marriage and Divorce Act, promulgated jointly by the American Bar Association and the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws. Herma Hill Kay, a law professor at the University of California, who had served on the Governor's Commission, worked as a co-reporter with Robert J. Levy of the University of Minnesota on the Uniform Marriage and Divorce Act. Kay was not shy to advocate for a cause she believed in. As a school child in South Carolina, Kay had boldly stood alone among her classmates, uh, disagreeing with their consensus that the South should have won the Civil War. Stunned, her teacher suggested law school. Kay's subsequent legal career represented a steady crusade for women's equality. Kay's own support for no-fault divorce must be interpreted in this light, even if, as she later acknowledged, the, uh, the state assembly had not uh, prioritized gender equity uh, when enacting the bill that she helped to draft. The Governor's Commission, however, had at her urging explored equitable results for property distribution and child custody, and subsequent to the 1969 Act, Kay herself continued to push for reforms that would shift financial awards uh, from men toward women. By 1980, 37 of the 50 states had significantly altered their divorce laws toward the no-fault standard of California and the Uniform Marriage and Divorce Act. While some states permitted both fault and no fault to operate side by side, the trend clearly was following the path of least resistance. Despite such apparent success, the no fault revolution actually failed in two important respects. First, it failed to deliver the promised benefits. Lawsuits involving marital dissolution became longer, more contentious, and more costly. Second, no fault insta uh, instead ushered in a new barrage of harms to women to men and especially to children. In brief, women were isolated and impoverished, men lost cost custody of their children, and children suffered uh, a, a variety of maladies, including risks of, of uh, depression 
anxiety, uh, criminal behavior, lower performance in school, and the like. And I provide some details on these points in my recent article in Family in America. But meanwhile, I want to ask this question, where were the conservatives? And so we proceed to part three, where we talk about cautious constituency builders and look at the reluctance of the religious right to address no-fault wrongs. No-fault reform has retained its status as the law of the land in part because it derives its justification from both sides of the political spectrum. Even if initially engineered by aloof lawyers and judges, not grassroots partisan reformers, no-fault divorce has strong champions on both the political left and right. Remarkably, the no-fault revolution of the 1970s and 1980s enjoyed bipartisan support despite an undercurrent of disagreement that fomented into a culture war during the 1990s, casting conservatives and liberals into a fierce debate over other moral and social issues, but generally not concerning divorce. In California, Republicans united with Democrats in supporting no-fault divorce. A leading sponsor of the bill was Republican State Senator Donald Grunsky, known as a prominent conservative. The law was signed by Governor Ronald Reagan, a conservative Republican who had risen to national attention after his 1964 endorsement of Barry Goldwater at the Republican National Convention. And ironically, Goldwater made a name for himself as a militant anti-communist. And yet Reagan's signature brought California into line with Soviet marriage reforms. Also ironic, Reagan, whom, who himself was divorced and remarried, would be swept into the US presidency in 1980 by a coalition of religious traditionalists known as the Moral Majority. Funded by the television evangelist Jerry Falwell in 1979, the Moral Majority listed as third among its founding principles that we are pro-traditional family. Translated into action, this meant campaigning against abortion, pornography, homosexuality, and the Equal Rights Amendment, while seeking to restore school prayer. Strangely, the moral majority was virtually silent about divorce. Standard histories of Falwell's movement do not even list divorce in the index. In 1988, Pat Robertson, another television evangelist, campaigned for the Republican presidential nomination under a banner of traditional family values. Although his candidacy failed to secure the endorsement of his party, his followers reorganized themselves around the Christian Coalition, a nonprofit organization established in 1989. The coalition advocated for public displays of the Ten Commandments, opposed obscene works funded by the National Endowment uh, for the Arts, attacked Darwinism, and implicated abortion and homosexuality with the decline of American society. As with the moral majority, however, the Christian coalition seldom addressed divorce. These are but a few of the pro-life, pro-family organizations that highlighted the benefits of marriage, but barely mentioned divorce. The fact that the divorce rate is higher in red states than in blue states may have something to do with the inability of conservative organizations, both political and religious, to gain traction for the repeal of no-fault divorce. If not crusaders for no-fault, conservatives at least have become complicit in accepting no-fault. It is increasingly difficult to distinguish which side conservatives favor in what remains of the debate. Pat Robertson, for example, suggested in 2011 to 700 club viewers that the spouse of someone with Alzheimer's disease may seek a divorce. He reasoned that severe mental illness is a kind of death, thus satisfying the tragedies of divorce persist into the third generation, as the impact of no-fault reforms passed now to the grandchildren of those who first sowed its seed in the 1960s and the 1970s. For example, Kids Divorce Stories on the Marriage Ecosystem website, sponsored by the Ruth Institute, collects first-hand accounts from the rising generation as they reflect upon the choices of their parents, who in turn inherited the new divorce culture ushered in by no-fault reforms. By listening to these voices, young men and women now have the opportunity to evaluate the decisions of those who have traveled the road before them, decisions by conservatives and liberals alike, by lawyers and theologians, by specialists and laypeople alike, decisions by a broad segment of Americans who either by action or by acquiescence participated in the no-fault revolution. Despite the challenges inherited from the 1960s, Today's young people still have reason to hope. If they can be equipped with tools for forgiveness and reconciliation, then their collective actions may be able to remove what it bliss from a list of oxymorons and restore it as the cornerstone of both civilized society and genuine personal fulfillment. To accomplish this, however, the rising generation will require two things and benefit from a third. First, young couples need mentoring from the minority of natural families who still remain. Second, they need encouragement from another minority group, 
fractured families who have reunited to become whole with one another again. And third, as we meet today in our nation's capital, let it not escape our notice that the welfare programs, tax codes, and a host of other public policies beginning in the 1960s have incentivized, incentivized divorce and cohabitation rather than fostering lifelong monogamy. When a future generation asks whose fault was no-fault divorce, let it not be said that we sat here today idle or that we surrendered to the aftermath in despair, but rather that patiently and persistently we sought to renew a culture from the family up. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for hosting. Um, I'm grateful to be able to speak to you today about this topic. I think it's one which few people articulate to themselves very frequently, but one that um, continue the changes that began in American reproduction in the 1960s continue today, and they continue to shape <clears throat> American reproductive behavior, including our nation's current below replacement fertility. Um, in addition to the aggregate changes that began in the 1960s, there was also um, a small group, but a non-negligible amount, um, tens of thousands of American persons, mainly um, minorities on welfare, who under federally funded programs were sterilized or injected um, with contraceptives without first giving their informed consent. And of course, it is impossible to talk about population control and family policy in the 60s without acknowledging the overpopulation scare that pervaded a lot of the thought at the time. So first, I'm going to give a very, very quick overview of world population trends at the time, just to sort of place the 1960s in demographic history. And then I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the big changes that occurred in American reproductive behavior in that decade. Um, and then I'm going to sort of delve into the policy at that time and how that allowed for a lot of these abuses um, to occur and how that shaped policy today. So in the 1960s, world population was changing quickly. It was growing rapidly. A lot of the people who were 60 or older remembered when the world population was about one and a half billion people. Um, and in the 1960s, it was three billion, and it was growing extremely quickly. We now know, of course, that that was simply due to a rapid fall in mortality, mostly from under five mortality. But at the time, a lot of people really believed that the world population was going to keep doubling very quickly and ad infinitum. And a lot of people were genuinely concerned about population and population growth. Um, so that's where the 1960s um, falls in demographic history, fast population growth, um, but only from falling mortality. Um, American reproduction, um, American fertility continued to fall. Um, the century-long trend was a fall with dips during recessions, and we had the post-war baby boom, and some fluctuations around socioeconomic phenomena. But during the 1960s, we saw the age at first birth fall very quickly, the age at first pre or the age at first birth rise very quickly. Women started to have births um, at later and later ages, but the age at first premarital sex dropped, and it dropped dramatically. Um, for teenagers in the 1950s, um, if you became 15 around that age, you wouldn't have you wouldn't engage in premarital sex on average until you were in your 20s. Whereas if you were a teenager in the 1960s, by the end of that, um, the average age had dropped to 18. Um, and over a decade, that's actually a very quick drop in an average. By comparison, since then, um, the average age at first sex has only dropped um, in that period by a year. It's now about 17. Um, the percentage of women using the pill tripled during that decade. And also during that decade, we saw the advent of sort of middling range contraceptives. So before then, you either had, you either managed your fertility with methods that required intentional thought at each intercourse, so withdrawal, condoms, or um, symptom-based methods, or you had very long-acting things such as sterilization. Um, during the 1960s, however, we saw the rise of the pill. Um, by 1965, 40% of married women under 30 were using the pill. 
1962, the Population Council held an international conference on the intrauterine device, and we saw the development of the copper IUD in this decade. Um, additionally, a clinic in Alabama began trials on Depo-Provera, which is an injectable contraceptive shot. And these trials in Alabama were actually predominantly conducted without informed consent and on poor black women. Um, but perhaps the most dramatic change that occurred in that decade was the change in ideal family size. Um, so for most of the 50s and the 60s, and indeed since Gallup poll had started to even ask this question, the vast majority, about 70% of Americans, said when asked that three or more children was their ideal family size. But by the end of the 70s, um, over the course of a little over a decade, that r ratio had completely reversed. So only 30% of Americans said that three or more was their fam ideal family size, and the vast majority of them said zero to two children was their family size. So there was a huge just com complete transition um, in what Americans began to think about as an ideal family. Um, but fertility control in the 60s sort of became about as a perfect storm as the race struggle surged in the United States, as we still had eugenic laws that were on the books. They hadn't been wiped out. California had sterilization laws on its books well into the late 70s. Um, and then, of course, there was the vast, um, vastly expanding welfare movement, um, which allowed a lot of public policymakers um, to sort of think that they had this invested interest in controlling the reproductive outcomes of women who were on welfare. Um, so for most of the early half of the 20th century, there were sterilization laws on the books, and these are a result of an old eugenics movement, and they only sterilized, well, I shouldn't say only, but they sterilized people in state mental institutions, um, obviously without their informed consent, but the motivation behind it was we were stabling feeble-minded people, and this occurred in psychiatric institutions. Um, at, and during the post-war period, eugenics had sort of become tinged in the American mind, um, but these laws remained on the books, and there weren't legal protections for persons against sterilizations. Um, and so in the second half of the 20th century, these laws were still on the books, and African American women's African American women, Native American women, and immigrants from Mexico and Puerto Rico especially were subjected to non-consensual sterilizations. Um, it happened so frequently that even um, in the early 1970s, a case had already made its way up to a federal district court. And in his decision, the judge estimated that 100,000 to 150,000 disenfranchised men and women had been sterilized annually under federal programs. This lawsuit, not only, until, only in the 70s, um, led the U.S. Department of Health to require that doctors obtain informed consent before sterilizing people. So that didn't come about until the end of the 1960s. Um, additionally, as federal welfare programs greatly expanded, um, these had a direct impact on federally funded family planning programs and among um, lower income fertility behavior. Um, during the 1960s, economic econometric analysis um, estimates that family planning um, funded by the federal government reduced childbearing among poor women by 20 to 30 percent, and that these federally funded programs prevented almost 2 million births um, in the decade between 1964 and 1973 among lower income women alone. Um, so these federally funded welfare programs that focused on um, low income fertility um, began in 1961 with the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, the AFDC. It extended its benefits rapidly in the 1960s, doubling in that decade. And in 1963, um, it didn't pass, but at a meeting discussing problems in the AFDC, people actually proposed sterilizing anyone who mothered Ill illegitimate children. But that rhetoric started, um, it really just showed a reflection in the state thinking that it had a vested interest in who reproduced and who didn't, especially if you were a recipient of government welfare. 
Several years after the AFDC expansion, Lyndon Johnston, Lyndon Johnson commenced his war on poverty with a prevailing rhetoric at the time that equated um, population control with poverty control, his war on poverty quickly became a war on women's fertility. Um, the head of Johnson's Office of Economic Opportunity began funding federal programs in 1963, even though contraceptive bans weren't struck down in a lot of states um, in, in Griswold versus Connecticut. Um, the Office of Economic, this Office of Economic Opportunity um, greatly expanded access to federally funded contraception um, in that decade. At the beginning, um, fewer than a half million received contraception through this office. By the end, it was up to four million. Um, Johnson continued to pu push for lower fertility, and he framed it as a war on population. It wasn't about um, women's reproductive rights, but about population control. In his 1965 State of the Union address, Johnson said we must seek new ways to use our knowledge to help deal with the population, with the explosion in world population. Later that year at the United Nations, Johnson said, quote, $5 invested in population control is worth $100 invested in economic growth. Also later in 1965, Johnson's Assistant La Secretary of Labor, Daniel Moynihan, published a report titled The Negro Family. In this, um, Moynihan um, s stated that the majority of Negro, Negro children receive public assistance under the AFDC program at one point or another in their childhood. Under a section in his report entitled, quote, the root of the problem, he attempted to diagnose the cause of black poverty. He started with an analysis of slavery and ended with the current black fertility rate. During the rest of the 60s, he wrote, the non-white population civilian, 14 years of age and over, will increase by 20%, more than double the white rate. He concludes, this population growth must inevitably lead to an unconcealable crisis in Negro employment. So he began to frame their fertility as inevitable to their poverty and linked those two together. Throughout that decade, the black community began to feel um, an increase in governmental population control, and black leaders in Pittsburgh towards the end of the decade actually began to protest in their local OE, against their local OEO offices asking that they cease the federal family planning programs. The black leaders highlighted the obvious inconsistencies between the family planning programs and other opportunities that the federal program gave them. They said, what welfare group sends volunteers to the homes of people who miss getting their checks or the chance to get welfare food supplies? Do they have volunteers to go out and tell people about good jobs? They didn't, but they had people pushing contraception that hard on the black communities. After Johnson left office, Nixon continued to push for lower fertility in, among American people. In 1969, he gave a special address to Congress just on the problems of population growth. He said, quote, in some respects, population growth affects everything that the American government does. He thereby continued this idea that the American government has a vested interest in its people's fertility. He says, it is clear that the domestic family planning services supported by the federal government should be expanded and better integrated. And at that address, he instituted the Commission on Population Growth, which was chaired by Rockefeller. The following year, Nixon signed into law the Public Health Services Act, commonly known as Title X, which provided more increases in contraception and fertility reduction programs, specifically among low-income populations in the United States. So while these federally funded welfare programs greatly influenced the fertility of certain sections of the American people, um, there was also a cultural change and a change of thought that affected everyone of all income classes. Through academia, culture, and media, population control and its rhetoric shifted and had a huge impact on the shift in American desired fertility. So the population, Rockefeller and all of his money, founded the Population Council in the 50s, and it began to host international conferences in the 60s, and it founded an academic journal called Studies in Family Planning in 1963. 
this journal and his population council propelled contraception from a sort of taboo topic that was considered obscene into something with not only with academic legitimacy, but it really pushed um, itself into academic thought and it ensured that population was talked about in academic circles. So while Rockefeller was getting population and family planning talked about in academic circles, Walt Disney and um, Paul Ehrlich ensured that overpopulation became a household word in the United States. In 1967, Walt Disney partnered with the Population Council to create a family-friendly cartoon encouraging couples to practice family planning. It has Donald Duck in it, and um, I had a little bit of it on my slide, but I unfortunately don't have it. But in this um, cartoon, Walt Disney, um, the video says, quote, Every couple has the opportunity to build a better life for themselves, but for people everywhere. And all of us have a responsibility to the family of man, including you. Love Donald Duck and the Population Council. Um, in 1968, Paul Ehrlich published The Population Bomb. And in it, he starts with these uh, apocalyptic claims, which of course have not come true. Um, but he says, quote, we must have population control at home hopefully through a system of incentives and, pe and penalties, but by compulsion if voluntary methods fail, close quote. This book sold millions of copies. Um, Ehrlich was hosted on all of the major talk shows, and he received many speaking requests. And his books helped sway the American public that along and along with the sort of feminist ideologies, people began to think that they had a public duty to contribute to declining family size. And again, the 1960s was the era that saw this dramatic shift in what Americans began to think about as an ideal or appropriate family size. So we had these cultural phenomenon like the Population Council among the academic elite and Walt Disney and um, the Population Bomb amongst average Americans. And then, of course, we had the top-down course of federally funded programs that dramatically altered reproduction for those on welfare. Um, ironically, at the time, um, the newly liberated women who self-regulated their fertility downwards because of overpopulation had implicitly accepted this premise that um, the public problems of the overpopulation scare were her responsibility and that other people, and she had took on what otherwise had been a private reproductive act. She took on this public burden into her reproduction. This assumption lives with us still, that the public has an interest in manipulating and controlling women's fertility. Um, this, with an increased public spending on welfare, has encouraged the mentality that the government has an interest in manipulating what we do. And this legacy, along with its bureaucratic leviathans formed to quell our fertility, remain with America today. Thank you. Do we take, like to take a few questions? I believe we have a mic, right? A handheld mic. So if you would just take that and we'll kind of pass that around. Um, any questions? Hang on, one, hang on just one second if you would. Well, is, is, it, is this on? Yes. It was an interesting uh, discussion, uh, but the today's show is uh, headlined with uh, rock and roll in it, and I didn't hear any mention of that. Because it strikes me that all of the legal issues that you raise are, are all um, the residue of, of cultural changes. It started back around World War I-ish and moved up through our country. And you can, you can chart it very clearly. Matter of fact, the first uh, court decision, remember, it didn't even say SEX. It said biological urges, because it was really impolite to say that in public. So we've, we've come a long way down. And so you know, it's really the culture that's the issue. It's not the legal proceedings. It really follow in the wake of the culture. Any comment, disagreement? We, we don't know anything about rock and roll on our panel. We're all classical <laughs> music, so. <laughs> yeah, that was my title. You can blame me for that. <laughs> I was trying to be catchy. Thank you, just ask, uh, what plans does Family Research Council or anyone else have? Thank you. Uh, what plans? What plans does anybody have to wage a culture war in the opposite direction? We can agree that it's very hard to sell conservative policies to a public that we can 
years, by most standards in the last 50 years, have moved to the left, that all strata and all POP measures are improving. Uh, what, sort of in, what sort of initiatives are there to try to sway the public back to a direction in where it was in the 60s, where this was seen as being very radical and very out of place, where it is less so today? So the question is, are there any cultural movements or plans to work on that culture war that um, so influences the political developments? Well, I, I don't know much about rock and roll either, um, but I'll, I'll try to answer this one. One of the challenges, I think, with being a conservative on these issues is it sounds like, uh, it sounds like you're complaining about everything going wrong, and that doesn't sell very well. Uh, except maybe to your own constituency who agrees that everything has gone wrong. But, but to reach out to that vital center and, and to uh, regain the majority, which I think is the point behind your question, I think it, it helps to find something that went right. And that's why I alluded at the end of my presentation to the idea of, of capturing stories of people who had a difficulty in their marriage but then reconciled. How did they reconcile? What were the benefits of that? And to have an inspiring um, you know, a leader who, who goes forward in the right direction and can draw others behind. So collecting stories like that, I think, would be uh, one, one thing that could be done. And I would add that the, this, the, the last question, the premise was correct, that it is culture that's driven a lot of the changes we see happening. We're describing the way that becomes codified as part of the law and official policy. But that's then perhaps the clue, well, at least one of the clues to, to recover, right, is to focus on cultural change. And uh, I'll give you an example. I, I, and I think someone here at Family Research Council first raised this idea for me uh, years, I mean, decades ago, but uh, the idea of uh, Jane Austen's novels, right? So Jane Austen writes these wonderful novels in which the parents are often somewhat hapless, right? They don't really know what's happening, and they're not, they're not good stewards of their children. Um, but, the, but the children are typically paragons of virtue, I mean, really remarkable, make uh, remarkable sacrifices uh, for, for virtuous life. And uh, so that there is a possibility that a new generation can do the same thing, right? Can say, well, you know, we recognize the challenges of kind of uh, just drifting along as we have in the past. And uh, there's a sociologist, Scott Stanley, uh, in Denver, who's great about this. He writes about sliding versus deciding, Deci you know, just making conscious choice to do things better. Uh, the, the challenge for all of us is to present that alternative in a way that, is, as uh, Dr. McPherson's noted, is attractive. Uh, how to do that precisely, I don't know all the answers. I mean, we, we, in many ways, we're trying to stop the loss currently, r right, with the de further disintegration of an understanding of marriage, like with same-sex marriage. But, but that, that, I think, is the, the culture is where the, the answer is going to come. I know that's not fully satisfactory to what you're thinking about, but it's an really important question. Yes. This was a breathtaking presentation. My, my mind isn't prepared to handle all of the details. It, it arouses enormous numbers of thoughts. But, uh, but, but one is paramount, and that is uh, the, the lack of uh, any crystalline voice that is relating the institution of marriage to the ordered creation of man as male and female. As you speak, it raises the question that has the church lost confidence in its own theology? As I grew up as a youngster, uh, the church, of course, was probably the conscience in a much more significant way than it is now as a cultural entity. Yet it was not really a seriously Christian culture in the, as I recall at any rate, in the 30s and the 40s but it was a God-fearing culture. There was a serious consciousness of the reality of an entity that had providential influence. And the Second World War again and again showed uh, evidences of that providence in favor of the, of the defeat of, of evil that was not in the, in the beat. So I, I guess the question in my mind is what, what do you see to be the uh, Maybe the problem, but uh, uh, clearly the need to engage the church in uh, restoring some sense of an awareness even of the proposition that marriage is rested in, in the created ordering of man as male and female. Is this microphone on, by the way? Yes. Okay, good. 
I, I think you're absolutely right. And speaking as an American historian, I, I think I can safely say that the decline of natural law is probably the single most profound transformation in the history of American thought. Um, going back to the Founding Fathers, clearly they all believed that God created us and that we had a, a moral nature that was accountable to one another and to God. And, and as you say, created male and female and thus foundational for marriage. And, and you can trace a variety of things um, that have distanced us from that tradition, some very early on in the Supreme Court's history, early 1800s. Uh, actually, ironically enough, being concerned about judicial activism, they say, let's stick to the text of the Constitution rather than invoke natural law for fear that under the cloak of natural law, uh, judges w would go activists, uh, ironically enough. And, and then, of course, you could talk about the influence of Darwinism or existential philosophy in the 20th century. And, and as our previous questioner suggested, you know, this, this kind of pop culture of I can do whatever I want and I can create my own nature and my own destiny. Uh, so I, I think you're right that, that the church, among other organizations, uh, should be reaffirming uh, this idea that human nature endures beyond culture, uh, that marriage is, in fact, pre-political. It exists before society and is the structure upon which society is founded rather than the reverse, where society has the freedom to redefine marriage? I think that you asked about whether, whether religious people have sort of lost confidence in their theology, and I, I, I guess I would think that they may have lost knowledge of it. It may, may be more, more at the root of the problem. Uh, because, you know, as you talk, as you talk about... Uh, uh, understandings of marriage, for instance, and you, you think about what the what the Savior taught in Matthew 19 about the nature of marriage, and he goes right back to the beginning. He says, you know, don't you remember the very beginning it was said, and it and it, it links initially that creation narrative. Uh, th there are a lot of resources. It's a really beautiful, robust, rich uh, tradition to draw on. Uh, not to mention, of course, that it's true as well, which is, is, is great. Uh, I think I think Alan Carlson, who is the the director or president of the of the Howard Center, has written some really important things that show that religions do have the ability to act counterculturally uh, to these kinds of trends and can sustain that over a period of time. So I'm optimistic in the in the church world. I really do think that the that that um, traditional religious believers. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so I'm LDS, and I think our, our tradition and others will be able to sustain uh, a strong pro-family cultures uh, that will then become more distinctive because, again, in my, my analogy against the backdrop, of sort of a darker backdrop, w which I think then provides a, a rallying point for uh, a, a more general cultural renewal. Any other questions? Yes, thank you, right back there. Um, yeah, I, I was getting back to mentioning David Rockefeller. I've heard a lot of people, um, conspiracy theorists, talk about the New World Order, and that's one of their goals. But um, do, do you think this might be more due to the environmental movement? Because I know in the same time period, um, I think it's called DDT, Rachel Carson, Car Carson wrote some book that it turned out was all BS. And I've been to talks where um, in Africa, most children die from malaria, and all you do with DDT is you put it inside of a hut. And, and currently, there's a lot of non-scientific people who are in this anti-GMO movement, and a lot of the GMOs that they're developing is like drought-resistant wheat and the golden rice with the vitamin A for kids in Asia so they don't go blind. Um, is, do you think that maybe this pu the big thing that's pu pushing this kind of population reduction? Um, yes. Um, definitely, um, as I talk about population and trying to, is this on? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, debunk overpopulation. People frequently, even today, say, well, what about the environment? More people inherently means more pollution, um, which is this, um, I think, sort of a, false logic because it means um, that short all things consistent all things equal if everything is the same more people will mean more pollution um, and yet over the past um, 50 years um, American population has grown um, but our pollution has decreased because people actually tend to are the only type of um, sort of economic capital that can innovate new ways to reduce pollution 
Um, and as countries become more prosperous, they're able to um, spend more of their um, economy towards um, uh, environmental cleanup. But um, at the time, yes, um, the two, um, and still they remain sort of linked together as um, intellectual friends. Um, Paul Ehrlich's Population Bomb was actually published by the Sierra Club, um, a rather radical environmental group. Um, so yeah, the two were and remain linked um, intellectually. Environmentalism is a theology that's very confident. <laughs> they really believe what they teach. Other questions? Over there. Uh, actually, this is for you, Ryan uh, McPherson. Um, about 20 some years ago, I was invited to take part in a panel put on by the American Bar Association, their family law section uh, convention in Chicago. Uh, so, 20 years after no fault or something, and I was the only critic I think they could find. But I get, I did my spiel, and there were some others on the panel, of course, who said everything was great. But at the end of it, one of the lawyers, these were all divorce, divorce lawyers, this was their convention, came up to me and he says, you, you, he says, you and everybody else just misses the point of what really caused no-fault divorce. I said, well, what was that? He says, lawyers are lazy. He says, they didn't like to have to do the work that was involved in proving a case uh, under the old fault-based system. They actually had to go out and investigate, uh, do work. Uh, and so on. Uh, he says, no fault, they don't have to do any work, it's really easy, but the bill stays the same. Um, and that, is, that was his explanation on that. Maybe cynical, but I guess I'd like your reaction to it. Sure, maybe we could make it even more cynical and, and say that um, one of the things that no fault does is it just about guarantees a repeat customer, because it, it doesn't really solve the problem, but then you end up with a child custody dispute uh, that, that continues in the years that follow, and then you need your lawyer again. Uh, Any time that, that one spouse moves to another state, the other spouse might challenge that because that changes the existing child visitation agreement, uh, et cetera. And it, uh, in the fuller article, which you all have in the journal uh, in your hands there, you'll find references to um, some reports coming out in the early 1980s as they're looking sort of at the 10-year mark around no fault. And what they're finding is, yeah, there were a few people saying hip, hip, hooray, this was a good thing, but, but many are saying it's more complicated, it's more expensive, it involves more lawyers, and, and, and the pain is greater for uh, the women, the men, and the children uh, involved. Right there in the back. The world is filled with circles, and we keep developing more and more and more circles. But if we're people of faith, our circle has a bullseye, and we never deter from Jesus Christ. And as we create more and more circles, and we don't address the real sense of where redemptiveness exists, all our policies and all of our theories and so on may make a dent here or there, but ultimately they are not redemptive. And as people of faith, we need to keep our eye on that bullseye, and that message has to be clear. We do not back away, even though that's not what the world wants to hear. Any other questions? So I could Google this question um, and get a bullet point list, but I wanted to ask you in the teal shirt uh, for your analysis, why is divorce, why are divorce rates higher in red states than in blue states? Sure. Okay. So um, it, it's a difficult thing to figure out, but uh, one, of, one of the articles that uh, you'll see uh, cited in the report that I wrote suggests it has to do with uh, economics. And so um, the, the being of lower income puts you at higher risk. I'm not sure I'm satisfied with that answer. I'm still puzzled by it myself. But there does seem to be um, some correlation with, with divorce being higher um, among states that you otherwise would think are more politically conservative. Another possible explanation is to remember the complexity of political conservatism, that it includes not only people who cherish uh, moral and social conservative values, but it also includes libertarians with a live and let live attitude. And, and, uh, and so people on the far right, on the libertarian end of the spectrum, also have supported no fault divorce for that reason. There's also the possibility that they marry more 
right? So, so Massachusetts has a lower rate than Utah of divorce, uh, but people don't marry in Massachusetts, so the rate's almost naturally going to be higher in a state. I think also you have younger populations that that's, you know you typically see higher divorce rates in younger populations just because there's more people. Get divorced. So I see it's over here. Yeah, just to, 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 to go back to your question, to answer that, to my mind, it is, in fact, because there is a stronger culture of marriage among red states than among blue states, where the left has made very strong inroads, and, and the question is dispensed with before they even consider it. But here you have the crash between intentions and between culture. The reason there's a high divorce rate in a place where people marry a lot is because we have, in fact, become a liberal culture. And so we do not have the sorts of long-term goals and the sets of, of established mores that keep a marriage going past its fifth year. Um, and this is an issue of culture. And also to go to the, 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 the no fault uh, issue that I heard before, you have a situation where you have some attorneys who want to do less work. This is, this is true. You have other attorneys who have other, other motives, the ulterior ones. But the most dangerous ones of all are the ones who recognize that family and that the family is the last great barrier against the initiatives of the administrative state to collectivize and, to their minds, properly direct a society. And so the most dangerous attorneys of all are not going to be the ones who are worried about doing less work or perhaps getting repeat customers, both of which are true. The third kind of attorney, the most dangerous one, the one who is the true believer, the one who now, the ones who essentially run our legal system. Uh, to my mind, the marriage, the family law in particular, and once again, we come against culture and against the people who in the 60s were the screamers and the shouters who today are in charge of all the institutions of this country, to include the judiciary, the universities, and in some unfortunate cases, the churches. Churches teaching more progressive points of view under the mantle of Christianity, thus barring themselves from an attack from the right. I would submit that the only real way to get around this is to get the public through, through a cultural initiative back to where it was in 1972, when you had the first new left candidate who lost in a landslide against, uh, let's say, a, a moderate Republican by any stretch, certainly by Republicans of that day as well as of this. Gold, uh, 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 McGovern lost in a landslide because the public was not where it is today. Today he might win or break even against somebody like Nixon. And so I think that, that the courts, the universities, that, that's all very well and good, but there has to be some sort of a cultural initiative. And you mentioned anecdotes. Well, statistics are a pile of anecdotes. And we can harness those, and we can show people how, how there is a better way. People are living it today. And the, co the country was at peace when a vast majority, the silent majority, to, to borrow a term, were living that uh, back in that day. Thank you. Any responses? All right, I think we have, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, well said. OK, yeah. good. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill Duncan, I wonder if you would um, respond to this. I was struck by Anne's um, summing up that the very private act in, in the court's terms, of sexual intercourse between a, a husband and a wife is now made very public in its consequences. <laughs> Whereas what's happening in the public defense of that, it's all being privatized. Um, and then what struck me was that quote you had, I think, from Lennon that I hadn't heard before, but it seems to nail it. And I wonder if this applies here. Was it the success of the revolution is the divine law? It doesn't matter. Consistency is not, but I wonder if you would comment on that, that on the one hand, the public consequence of sexual intercourse and begetting children is rising, while the public defense of it is decreasing. I think that's a, 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 an excellent point, and, I, and uh, Anne's presentation was really superb and helpful. 
I think it probably relates to that last point, that in many ways when you have a strong institutional family, it does provide something of a barrier between the state and the individual and allows people to, to uh, in our system, I think our understanding would be that that's how we transmit values is within a family. And that's done in a part, it's just quite, quite apart from what the state is doing. But when there is no nothing, significant, right, if marriage is just a sort of a random collection of individuals bumping up against each other, uh, maybe don't put it too crudely, um, then, then, then there's no, there's nothing to, to uh, uh, everything becomes a sort of a, has a public significance. This is one of the things that's kind of interesting, as much as the court talks about private, 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 what they're doing is they're harnessing state power to sort of put their imprimatur on 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 private choices and to say and so this is there was a, a colloquy in the in the oral arguments last week where uh, one of the one of the attorneys attorney representing the state of Michigan said look the government doesn't have any interest in in uh, trying to dignify what individuals do I mean, there's not that's not a, of any interest to us as a state we're not trying to say what you do is fine and what you do is not fine. Uh, and uh, Justice, I believe it was Justice Kennedy, said, what? What do you mean? Of course that's what marriage is. Of course marriage is a way of saying that adult choices are, are as good as any other choice. So I think that the piece we haven't brought in is the idea of equality. And that's where, uh, you know, kind of very radical egalitarianism, that's where this public significance comes, is that the, the government has to police uh, what families do to ensure that no choices are considered better than others, uh, other than the choice to have children, right? And uh, as a father of seven, I'm probably not the right person to <laughs> don't know, talk about that. But um, the the I, I I'm not sure I'm getting a, a precisely at your question, but I but I think that I think that that's that the public significance becomes something quite different. It's, it's it's policing and ensuring that there's no strong unions, strong relationships. The government would rather decide how many children are appropriate and those kinds of things than allow that to happen in, you know, Chesterton's words, kind of the, the chaos of, the wonderful chaos of uh, families where they get to make that choice on their own. Um, I would comment and say that um, sort of this dissection between um, uh, reproduction and sexuality occurred, and that was enabled by contraceptives and long-acting contraceptives. Um, you'll notice that the government didn't go in in the 60s and try and prevent people from having sex to keep them from reproducing, it went in and said, well, sex is no longer inherently a reproductive act. Um, um, and there was this new philosophy that said, sex doesn't make children, but failed contraception or lack of contraception creates children. Um, and that's something that's much more easy to control <laughs> rather than trying to go and make sure that everyone on welfare um, watch what they're doing at night because who knows, maybe they'll have sex, but instead of saying, oh, come into this clinic, um, sign this paper here, yes, yes, otherwise it'll make sure you continue on your welfare. Um, and that's just, it's a much easier place for the government to come in. Um, also, while we're sort of throwing around anecdotes, um, I spent a um, brief time at an externship um, in a family court in Oakland, <laughs> which was a very sad, depressing place. Um, but I was there with other Berkeley students who were not conservative. They were very liberal. Um, and I think their experience, though, with family court in Oakland, they had never considered how intrusive it was. We spent days there watching this judge who had an intimate knowledge of every street in Oakland and how long commutes took because he had to say exactly when fathers and um, mothers dropped off kids. Um, he regulated, you know, who got them on which days. Well, if you leave your commute on this time and take this bus, then you can pick the kid up from school. And just these very intimate down to like the very last detailed um, control from the family courts over um, these children and their parents. And they were astonished at how authoritarian and intrusive the family courts were. It's, it's interesting that the, the part, part of the distress that people experience in divorce courts is just that precise thing. They have m micro, but it's not connected to any sense of justice. Right. Because I think many people would say, well, you know, gosh, you know, you deserve perhaps to lose a little bit of autonomy if you make certain choices. But the, but the courts, the one thing they'll exclude 
is any knowledge about who did what that created that situation, you know, and it's very distressing to go in with, to be in a family court and someone says, well, I want to talk about the abuse I suffered or the infidelity. The courts are not interested in that at all. And so it creates a, dis a, a, a pretty significant disconnect between the, you know, everything is now controlled. I can, you know, what I say, can say on a phone call to my children is now monitored by the court, but it has nothing to do with any fault, anything that I did wrong. And I, I've heard a, a, a former judge who's a Utah legislator say uh, that, that that's a really serious, serious problem because people's perception that they won't be heard, just even their, you know, their grievances won't even be heard by the courts. Wow. But again, that intrusion comes despite any kind of considerations of justice and more traditional. So maybe what we need is a 72-hour waiting period between when you want to file for a divorce and when you can, and then in the intervening time you need to receive information so that you can give informed consent to realize the change that's taking place. But that would only help the, the one parent who, or one spouse who files for divorce. What about the other one who doesn't want to get divorced? But now that we have unilateral dissolution of marriage, that other person is essentially powerless to prevent the other person from ending the marriage and introducing the state as the, as the new uh, head of household. And, and there, you know, when, when New York was the last state to join the official no-fault uh, revolution uh, just a couple of years ago, that, there actually was a strong feminist pushback because there is some leverage power if, for, if an individual, if it's not a purely unilateral divorce, someone can say, well, look, you're at fault, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna th make that part of the hearing if I don't get, you know, there, there does allow for some, some negotiation, but there's no bargaining power if the state says we're on the side always of the person who wants divorce. One last question. Anyone? Yes, uh, my question is, uh, do you think if uh, mainstream uh, American society has something to learn from Mormon church, from LDS church about, you know, family values and uh, uh, very communal life, uh, and then largely even from uh, Middle Eastern or uh, 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 Asian cultures, where family uh, uh, is a very, very critical uh, unit of the society. So how can, you know, American good uh, learn something from them, from Mormon church or from Middle East or Asian cultures? Thanks. Bill? It's really an unfair question. <laughs> of course, I think, <laughs> uh, I think we have a lot to, to, to say about that. And, and, but but I, absolutely, I think that there, there, is, there, there are strong cultures who do, even, even with all that we talk about, they do have different outcomes. And I think we do need to look at, 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 at that. Um, uh, It's, it's, the challenge is it's not easy to duplicate. Does that make sense? Because, because it, comes from the, it comes from a doctrinal or cultural resources that aren't, you can't just duplicate and say, well, you know, for instance, uh, uh, if you say, well, Latter-day Saints uh, have uh, these family home evenings. Every Monday night they have uh, a lesson and they do things with their kids. Well, everyone, if everyone does, you won't necessarily get the same result, right, because there's all kinds of things at work. Uh, we all have rich traditions to draw on, but if we ignore those, that's, that's part of the challenge we have. I don't know, I feel like, I feel like uh, I'm, pro I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm answering your question well, but I, the answer is yes, there's a lot to learn from those who do sustain strong family cultures, and there, and there are many, Orthodox Jews, uh, Amish, and, and others who do. And learning lessons from them, I, I want to again endorse what Alan Carlson has done on this because he's written about this and, and, and talked about how, how you know, there are uh, subsets of the population that do maintain strong family because they do have higher fertility do, you know, in a lot, on a lot of these. And uh, learning from that is a, is a powerful, it's a, that's a powerful resource that's untapped is these cultures who do manage to, to maintain strong families. On that note, um, thank you again so very much for being here today. I just want to point out two things before you leave. First of all, if you haven't had lunch, there is lunch outside. I know a couple of you grabbed it on the way in, but there's plenty left. And second of all, there is a journal on each one of your seats, and there's um, extras in the back. And I would love to not have to put them in the overhead compartment. So please take several. They make excellent gifts. And thank you again to our panelists, and thank you again to the Family Research Council for hosting us today.